Okay, I would like to welcome you to the Authors Hour. Um, my name is Fred Zerm. I represent the Friends of the Chautauqua Writers Center. Uh, we're a volunteer organization that aims to support and supplement the activities of the institution at the Writers Center. And by doing that, we hope to encourage writing and writers both on the institution grounds and beyond. Um, I'm gonna take a slight pause here because I wanna make sure that I'm, Susan Nussbaum for some reason is large on my screen and I wanna make sure that we're not just recording Susan. Anyway, as I was saying, we, represent um, and try to support and supplement the activities of the Writers' Center. Um, we present two writers each week associated with Chautauqua. Today we have a novelist and, well, usually a poet, but today an essayist. Our first reader will be Patricia Averbach. Her debut novel, Painting Bridges, out of Bottom Dog Press in 2013, was praised by Michelle Ross, book critic for the Cleveland Plain Dealer, as an introspective, intelligent, and moving novel. Her second work, Resurrecting Rain, has come out through Golden Antelope Press to great reviews, and it's actually a finalist for the Florida Writers Association Royal Palm, or one of their Royal Palm Literary Awards, and Chanticleer's Somerset Award for Literary Fiction. Um, she's also a poet, and her poetry chapbook, Missing Persons, won the London-based Lumen Camden Award Prize, and was cited by the Times of London's Literary Supplement as one of the best small collections of the year. Aberbach divides her time between Shaker Heights, Ohio, Sarasota, Florida, and Chautauqua, New York. And she did serve as the Chautauqua Writers Center director for several years and is still an active member of our community. Please welcome Patricia Aberbach. Thank you. <laughs> um, I'm going to start with the little blur, uh, blurb, a, a sentence from the, the back of the book to give you uh, an introduction to, to the novel. Uh, Dina's house is being auctioned off at sheriff's sale and her marriage is falling apart. As her carefully constructed life unravels, her thoughts return to the New Moon Commune outside Santa Fe where she was born and to Rain, the lesbian mother she abandoned at 14. No one, not even her husband and children, know about New Moon or that she sat Shiva. In other words, she went through a traditional Jewish um, ritual for mourning the dead for Rain, her mother, in exchange for living in her Orthodox grandmother's house in a suburb of Cleveland. Um, so as her marriage goes from bad to worse, she becomes uh, kind of estranged from her husband uh, communication breaks down and she begins an affair uh, with a, a Hungarian art professor. And uh, I'm starting in the middle. She's just returning from a little tryst with uh, the professor. And or the professor ordered a bottle of Chianti at Palermo a cozy tavern in Chesterland, a small town half an hour east of Shaker Heights. Dina was curled up beside him in a wooden booth, one hand resting on his knee beneath the table. Palermo was their favorite trysting spot since it was both charming and discreet. It felt like a magical space carved out of time where they were protected from the perils and responsibilities of the outside world. Of course, that was an illusion. Some part of Dina must have known it even then. Was it fate that intervened, bad luck, or simply her own bad judgment? 
If she'd refused to meet Andor that night, how would her life have changed? Later, Dina would look back at that evening as the tipping point, the moment that set her on a course she had never imagined. It was late afternoon, or maybe it was already early evening. The sun had already set, so it was sometime after five. They sat by a large picture window watching snowflakes swirl in the beam of passing headlights as a real fire crackled in a large stone fireplace. The tavern smelled of wine and garlic, wet wool and burning pine. All the holidays were over. Christmas, New Year's, Martin Luther King's birthday, even Valentine's Day. There was nothing to look forward to but long cold nights and endless snow until the spring. In two weeks, Andor would be gone, and Dina's marriage would return to its old routines. She'd go back to being a reliable wife and mother, and no one would ever know she'd taken a short sabbatical from her real life. Andor took her hand and pressed it to his lips. Dina pulled it back and shook her head. There were limits. She needed to maintain some credible deniability. He looked at her with such concern and affection that Dina felt a pang of loss, a premature nostalgia for the time they'd spent together. He'd been kind to her, so tolerant. He'd just spent the last 10 minutes listening patiently to her familiar litany of complaints about her assistant at work. Why do you worry about that jealous bitch? Alice is a clerk, she's nothing. You have all the power, use it. Stand up for yourself. Dr. Richter, her boss, thinks you're gold and that's the only thing that matters. Dina smiled, unconvinced but grateful. Thank you, you've been a good friend. Who's going to keep up my spirits once you're gone? Come with me, give up everything for love. Why not? You could do it. He was saying, he was toying with her. He knew there was no way she would jettison her life to follow him to Sarasota, but it was a game they played. Why wait, we'll leave right now. He kissed her on the lips. I'll get the car. And our don't, Dina laughed, giving him a quick kiss in return. We're out in public. You're right. Andor feigned a change of heart as the waitress headed toward them with two steaming plates of pasta. Let's wait until we've had our supper. It was so cozy sitting knee to knee with this charming man exchanging university gossip, flirting and sipping wine. They discussed Andor's new job in Florida, European cinema, and a recent, recent drive, rash of drive-by shootings while slurping Forkfuls of fettuccine drenched in butter, cream, and melted cheese. What they didn't discuss was Andor's life. She knew nothing about his childhood or his family, and that was fine with Dina. The most personal thing she knew was that he owned a house in Hungary with a mortgage that he was desperate to pay off. Uh, dinner over and the bill paid, Andor helped Dina into her coat. She felt his hands linger on her shoulders and his lips nuzzling her neck. There was no question about it. She'd miss him when he was gone. Yet, at the same time, there was something else, something ready to let go and move into spring without fear, guilt, or excess baggage. They kissed goodbye in the unlit parking lot, then left the restaurant in separate cars. Snow had buried her old Taurus while they'd been eating dinner, and Dina drove hunched over the steering wheel, navigating through a porthole she'd cleared in the windshield. Mayfield Road was unplowed and treacherous. Normally, she'd have taken the highway home, but there'd been an accident, and the exit was blocked by two police cars and an ambulance. She wouldn't be home before nine at the speed she was going. There was no excuse for her behavior. At the very least, she should have called Martin with some lame alibi. He deserved that much. She was getting careless, careless and selfish. She'd have to watch herself. This thing with Andor had gotten out of hand. Dina clutched the wheel, trying to keep her eye on the icy road. Andor's tail lights had merged into the flow of traffic and disappeared long ago and she was now following a white SUV sporting a bumper sticker that read, God and guns, two things you can't believe in. 
Hitting the brakes when the SUV came to a sudden stop, being a fishtail to the left, nearly colliding with a tow truck. Slowing to 15 miles per hour, she finally turned onto Lee Road and inched her way toward Van Aken Boulevard. She was within a mile of her apartment and starting to breathe normally again when a patch of black ice sent her swerving off the road. When the car finally came to a stop, Dina found herself on the lawn of St. Peter's Lutheran Church facing the wrong way. As shaken as she was, she managed a quick inventory and concluded that neither she nor the Taurus were in immediate need of repair. To her great relief, the engine started right up, but then the car wouldn't budge. The tires simply spun, dig, uh, simply uh, da, da, da. digging deeper and deeper grooves into the muddy, snow-sodden grass. Dina switched off the engine and reached for her phone. Martin, I'm sorry I'm late, but I've been in an accident. No, I'm, I'm fine. It wasn't serious, but I'm stuck in a snowdrift in front of St. Peter's. Oh, that's sweet, but you don't have a car. There's really nothing you can do. Do we still belong to AAA? A few minutes later, she called again. Just wanted to give you an update. AAA says it can't keep up with all the calls coming in. It could be two hours before they get a truck to me. No, don't worry. I have a full tank of gas, so I'll be fine. See you in the morning. Bye. Dina clicked off the phone. She would never have chosen to spend two hours trapped in a snowbound car. But the accident had given her cover. Maybe skidding off the road was an act of good fortune. Accidents make people late. Martin hadn't even mentioned the time. It was going to be a long night, but she had a good heater and a radio. Dina clicked on WCLV, closed her eyes, and sank into a violin concerto by Vivaldi. Persistent tapping on the window brought her back to consciousness. Had the tow truck arrived already? It couldn't have been two hours. Her eyes took a moment to focus, and then she saw Martin's face beaming at her. He was bundled up like an Eskimo and carrying a shovel. Dina lowered the window and smiled back at him. Martin, how in the world did you get here without a car? I walked. He was clearly delighted with himself. In this blizzard? Yep, half shovel will travel. Waves of conflicting emotion made Dina a queasy. Part of her, a substantial part, was deeply moved by her husband's gallantry and devotion. But she also bristled, annoyed that he was being so nice, that he was so oblivious to the vast chasm that had opened up between them, that he didn't understand that she didn't deserve his loyalty and attention. Are you okay? Do you, do you want to sit in the car and warm up a minute? Nope, let's get this baby back on the road. He began shoveling at the snow and casing her back tires. Dina got out and stood next to him, hugging herself against the cold air as large wet snowflakes stuck to her hair and eyelashes. Is there anything I can do? Do you need help? He was huffing great clouds of breath from the unaccustomed exertion. Why was Martin doing this? He'd pull a muscle or catch a cold. Yeah, hand me the floor mats, then get back inside. No point in both of us freezing to death. Anyway, I'll need you to start her up in a minute. Dina did as she was told, then waited until Martin gave the signal. With a bit more shoveling, a repositioning of mats, and a mighty push, the tires finally found traction to roll off the lawn, over the curb, and back onto the road. Martin took out the maps, threw them in the back, then climbed into the passenger seat. He was panting hard. Even in the dim street light, Dina could see his cheeks were bright red. There was a time when he'd been as fit as Elliot, their son. He'd played varsity tennis and taken long cross-country bike trips, but that was years ago. Now Dina watched her husband try to catch his breath and hoped he wasn't going to have a heart attack. You shouldn't have come out like this. It's way too cold and slippery. You could have fallen and broken something or gotten frostbite. Martin didn't say anything. He was holding his hands in front of the heater, trying to defrost his frozen fingers. But thanks, that was really nice of you. 
I thought I was hallucinating when I saw you out there with your shovel. No problem. You're my wife. We're supposed to look after each other. He patted her affectionately on the knee. That did it. She thought she was so smart, so in control, but she'd been kidding herself as much as her husband. A tsunami of conflicting emotions crashed against the last of her defenses and spilled out in a deluge of tears. What's the matter? Uh, what happened? Dina couldn't see clearly and the car began to weave with the spasmodic heaving of her shoulders. One of her tires hit the curb. She felt it bounce and slide, but managed to stay in her own lane. Whoa, you'd better pull over. I'll take it from here. Martin put his hand on the wheel and guided them toward the plowed, a plowed driveway. Dina brought the car to a stop and handed him the keys. He waited while she wiped her eyes and blew her nose before asking, Now, what's all this about? I don't know. Dina wasn't lying. She didn't know why she did anything anymore. I guess I was more frightened than I realized. Thank you for saving me. I'm so sorry for everything. I, I don't know what I'd do without you. That's all right. Martin pulled her close and kissed the top of her head. There's nothing to be sorry about. You didn't even ding the car. Their gloved hands sat intertwined on the seat between them as they drove the rest of the way home. Neither of them said a word as they parked the car, took the elevator up to the third floor, unlocked their door, and hung up their coats stood facing each other in the small entry hall, as awkward as teenagers on a first date. Dina was about to break the silence to say something that might narrow the rift between them. But Elliot chose that moment to come barging through the door. He didn't look at his parents as he tore past them, toward the bathroom, dripping blood from a gash on the back of his head. He slammed the door shut and locked it before Martin and Dina could catch up with him. All they could do was shout questions and advice from the hallway. What happened? Do you need to go to the ER? Someone should look at that. Were, were you in an accident? What's going on? They could hear their son opening and shutting the medicine cab cabinet and rummaging through drawers. I'm all right. Go away and leave me alone. Martin began jiggling the doorknob and pounding on the door. Don't make me break this down. What the hell happened? Open up this minute. I'm okay. I just don't want to talk about it. Back off, will you? Ouch. Dina became more alarmed. What's happening? Are you in pain? Oh, for God's sake. Uh, Elliot's uh, voice had a hard edge she'd never heard before. Could you get off my case and let me take care of this? Dina and Martin looked at one another, bewildered. Backing off wasn't their style, but Elliot was 18. This was new territory. Were respectful parents supposed to let their almost adult children bleed quietly in private? Martin dropped his arms to his side, a gesture of defeat. Okay, but we'd like to know what happened when you're ready to talk. Yeah, sure, now leave me alone. Dina turned all her fear and anxiety toward Martin. That's it? Your son's just had a serious energy, uh, injury? Maybe a concussion? And you're just going to walk away? Don't you care? He's an adult, Dina. There's nothing we can do. I can get a screwdriver and take that door down. That's what I can do. Dina was being irrational, and she knew it, but she wasn't having a rational night. No, you can't. Don't be crazy. We'll have to wait until he's ready to talk to us. Did you just call me crazy? And like that. Whatever rapprochement, rapprochement had been possible a few minutes earlier was gone. Dina stomped into the kitchen to make herself a cup of tea. Martin slumped back into the living room and switched on the TV, and Elliot remained locked in the bedroom behind an impregnable door. Thank you. I can't hear you. Thank you very much. I had muted myself in case household intruded. Um, thank you. Uh, please look for that book. Um, unfortunately, I didn't get the links downloaded. 
Uh, but maybe you can type them into chat. Huh. Okay, um, you can get uh, Resurrecting Rain from Bookstore One in Sarasota. Okay, what a coincidence. And I'm going to give you a link, and of course, you can get everything on Amazon. <laughs> unfortunately, you can get but, everything. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah. Let's see. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll post it in chat. Okay, great, great. Um, just a, a few more words um, about the Friends of the Chautauqua Writers' Center before um, we go on to our next reader. Um, we sponsor several events. You're at one of them, the Author's Hour, every Thursday at 12.15. Next week, we will be having Carolyn Haldeman, a memoirist and a longtime teacher with her delightful, amusing memoir, Adventures of a Septuagenarian Teacher. And Karen Wyatt, who does both prose and poetry, will be reading from her book of poetry, Stealing Dust, Wearing Heels, and the Rust Belt. On Sundays, we sponsor open mic at five o'clock. We also sponsor the writing contest and that deadline is coming up this Sunday. I think, yes, I have shared the screen. If you want to find out more about these different activities, you can go specifically on our website. You'll find uh, information, submission forms, uh, Zoom links for the things that are on Zoom. And for something like the Favorite Poem Project that occurred yesterday, you can find a YouTube link shortly. I don't know if it's been posted by the webmaster yet. Also, if you go on YouTube and type in Friends of the Chautauqua Writers Center um, channel, you can find us that way. And if you don't know Chautauqua, if you're somebody that's just uh, zoomed in but has never been here physically, just go to that website, www.chq.org, and you can find out general information. Or if you go to assembly.chq.org, you can find out what activities are offered online this year. Next up, we have Shara McCollum. From Jamaica, Shara is the author of six books of poetry published in the US and UK, including No Ruined Stone, forthcoming in 2021, and Mad Woman, winner of the 2018 OCM Bocas Prize for Caribbean Poetry and the 2018 Moten Book Prize from the New England Poetry Club. McCallum's work has appeared widely in the US, the Caribbean, Latin America, and Europe, and been translated into Spanish, French, Italian, Romanian, Dutch, and Turkish. She is the recipient of a Witter Biner or Binner Award Fellowship from the US Library of Congress and a Poetry Fellowship from the National Endowment for the Arts, among other awards. McCallum is a liberal arts professor of English at Penn State University and on the faculty of the Pacific University Low Residence MFA program. Today, I believe she'll be reading a personal essay instead of poetry. Please welcome Cheryl McCallum. Thank you, Fred. Thank you, everyone. That's so formal for this group. I feel so happy being here with all of you. Um, almost everybody I know, and so I thought for that reason, I would um, share excerpts from an, a personal essay that was just published in March. Um, many of you know me as a poet, but I do write essays and I have for 20 years. And I think I'm trying to keep myself honest by doing something new. So um, also encouraged by Jimin. This is, so we're gonna give this a whirl. We'll see how this goes. Mainly I wanna make sure that I don't read too long. So I'm taking a look at the clock right now and giving myself a time when I need to stop. Um, okay. 
I think I'll just not say anything about the essay and just read. Hope. If you have questions for either Pat or Shara, could you either type them in chat or raise your hand under participants or for uh, my co-host who might switch to gallery view, maybe you can wave a hand. So one of those three methods, if you have a question for either of our authors. And we'll see what happens. <laughs> they could be awestruck. Susan and Carol both shot hands up, so. Okay, why don't you just, you're in control. Who do you want to call on? Oh. I, I guess I'll go with Susan because I think it was a snap second before Carol and then we'll go to Carol. <laughs> okay. Be sure to unmute yourself. Hey, your yeah. First of all, thanks so much for both of your readings. It was just wonderful. Uh, enjoyed it so much. Um, Shara, it seems to me the story of your father, you've written in poetry. Have you not? I have. Oh, okay. So I, it was... But that was my only question. I, I, somehow it was coming back to me and I thought, oh my gosh, I've heard this before. <laughs> Susan, I'm really glad you asked that question because I was just so super attentive to not wanting to go too long why I didn't say more. And mm -hmm. I hope that the pieces I excerpted could make sense. I took out huge chunks of the essay, but I tried to give a sense of the sequencing. So you heard the first and the last and the midsection. But yeah, I... Um, I am dealing with exactly the same material and even the same images. So those of us who are poets, it might be interesting. I mean, many of us in this room also write poetry, and I know, Pat, you do as well as fiction. But the relationship between poetry and memoir, I think, is really close. And the reason I'm writing the same moments in essay form is that there are things that I can't do in the lyric that I want to be able to do in the essay. So. Um, you know, if you, if you know the poems, Susan, you know my second book has a lot of poems about my father and even some of these images that are in this essay come right out of that opening sequence from that book. So it will feel familiar, but hopefully expansive in a different way. Well, beautiful. Thank you. Carol, you were next, I think. Townsend. Carol Townsend. Sorry, I'm looking at the right Carol. <laughs> but you're muted. You're still oh, muted, muted, Carol. You're muted. <laughs> Let me see if I can send her a message. If I can. No, she just doesn't seem to know how to undo it. Do you want to use the chat, Carol? You could use the chat feature if you can't unmute. How about that? Okay, uh, that's, that's great. Um, Ashera, I was wondering in writing and uh, triggering the writing of this essay, if there was a particular trigger, if you will. Um, it's something that happened or transpired or a thought that just happened that that started you writing this in essay form? Um, so I think many things. This essay is quite old. I only just published it in March because I needed some space from it to have the... So I think the difference for me between where it started and where it ended up is, is inherent to the form of the essay, but also to memoir itself. Um, which I think is the story about the writer's need to tell this story. It took me a long time to piece that part together. Mm -hmm. But the initial impulse for this is that moment in the car with my sister. Um, and it took me 20 years to sort out why that was so um, painful for me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So traumatic. Um, and I could write about that moment and capture it in metaphor faster than I could Obviously, even talk about it with you all right now is hard for some reason. I think it's because I know you all. <laughs> and so if I didn't know you, it might be easier. Mm -hmm. um, but I do think it took that long. And yeah. that is the answer is it started with an image. 
but the, the why did I need to keep going back to that moment? And what did it say about my relationship, not only to my father, but to my sister? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Who I'd been estranged from. And, um, and we've reconnected now, but it took 20 years for me to make my way back to my country and to my parts of my family mm -hmm. by going back repeatedly. And it was painful every time, and it still is. And I know many migrants who say when they've read this essay or poems that they won't go back because of what you face is the loss. You don't face the what, it doesn't stand still for you, you know? And so you change, the people change, the country changes. So it took that long. So that's to say, if you wanna write essays, I mean, some of you probably write essays, right? You already know what I'm saying. But I stumbled into that form as a poet who was very adept and loving image and metaphor and had not the faintest idea about what to do about reflectiveness, which I think is also equally vital to the essay as a form. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Can you let people know where they can read the full essay? So if you just want to send me an email, I think you all have my email address. I can send you the PDF for this. If you wish to support the magazine, it came out in its fourth genre which it's in their spring issue. Um, and it, they would love, of course, for you know, people to buy the copy, but I'm happy to also email you the PDF. So I'll just put my email in here again for everyone in chat, and then you can read the whole thing because um, it doesn't, you know, there's more to it than those sections. So um, yeah. And in the Southern Review, I have another personal essay coming out in the fall. I'm just making, you know, big adverts for journals here who could use readers. So if you um, are interested, I'm working on a collection of essays that are some that I've been writing, as I said, over 20 years, dealing with different aspects of memory, race, migration, loss. And the one in the fall is much more about race than it is. It's about my father, but it's also about race. Okay. Do we have any other questions either on chat or raising your hand on participant or waving your hands on gallery view? Clara. Hi, Clara. Hi there. It's nice to see both of you. Thank you for such a beautiful reading. Each one of you was definitely um, going in different subject areas, but both just so well written. Um, it was just a pleasure to hear both of you. Um, the question that I have probably more for Shara, Shara is, um, have you tried to put together the poems and the essays? Like did the poems you had written inform your process as you were writing the essay that you just read? Um, I try not to look back on them, to be honest with you, Clara, because I think there's so much, even when I read it just now, I realized I'm just sort of borrowing from myself in ways that I'm unconscious about. So I worry if I were to sort of line them up, I would do even more of that. Um, but um, I am writing some essays that are more lyric and some that are longer essays in this collection. And I'm hoping that that will like I said, I hope that this isn't just a metic experience to the as the poems. Um, mm -hmm. And nor do I hope that for them to summarize the poem, because you all know who've worked with me, if a poem can be summarized, I think it shouldn't bother. Um, so <laughs> I'm hoping it does something bigger. Like it's more about a canvas issue for me as a minimalist kind of artist, thinking about a slightly larger canvas to work with, yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Pat, what about you? I would love to hear what's the relationship for you between poetry and prose? Interesting. I was just discussing that with uh, someone who was, we were doing a podcast on that subject. Um, I, I think that um, what uh, poetry uh, offered me more than anything was uh, an exercise in concision, leaving things out uh, and focusing, finding exactly the right word and uh, um, not, yeah, 
and not not going off on tangents. <laughs> it it focus. I think poetry focuses you. Um, but I mean, you know, obviously, it uh, also teaches you metaphor and uh, imagery and you know, all those poet poet type stuff. But it was uh, the uh, an exercise in leaving stuff out. Thank you. It sounds a little bit like sculpture. You take away what you don't need mm -hmm. to reveal the statue, right? Yeah. Well, for anybody who starts with poetry and is interested in this, the first, um, to, and this goes with what you're saying, Pat, the first essay I read was just because it kept getting longer. So in some way, or I mean, I wrote, excuse me, I just, I thought it was a poem and then it just kept going. And so I think it's maybe the, the, what you said is the key is like, what do you not leave out now? What compels you to keep going might be a way to go at it. So I know so many of you are poets. So I think what an interesting exercise then to try if you want to take one of your poems more consciously, like Clara, you're saying, and say, what would happen if I made this poem into an essay? Um, could be, it could be fun. You know, in quarantine, we need fun. I heard um, something. <laughs> so, first name Sanders, who did Lincoln at the Bardo. Uh, I just George. George. Yeah, George, uh, George Sanders. He he has a funny, uh, almost like a stand-up uh, bit that he does of, about editing a, a piece of prose and how he keeps cutting out. You know, this isn't necessary. This is obvious. This is redundant <laughs> until he's left with. Uh, kind of the period at the end. <laughs> I'm just checking chat. Has any any other questions? No, well, I give you permission to unmute and give Pat and Shara a rousing Round of applause. Let's do that. I always hey, say, Bill, yes, I just saw you there too. <laughs> Sorry, you guys can't see where I'm looking. I didn't know Bill was there too. I thought it was just Jane. <laughs> okay. Great. Great. Bill has a mustache. And a, <laughs> it's amazing. The now, quarantine uh, hairdos are great. Fred, your beard is long and long. And <laughs> yep. Hair is getting my hair is compliments of my daughter who gave me my first, you know, COVID-19 haircut yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, you all, you can all know something about me you don't know before this, which is that I've always cut my own hair. So this has come in very handy. I know people are very surprised. I see Shara's face go like, what? Yep, I've cut my own hair for the whole time since I've lived in central Pennsylvania, basically. Wow. Could not find a hairdresser to deal with my hair, so I learned how to just manage my own. And I highly recommend it people save so much time and money not to go to a salon. Okay. <laughs> so. well. I'm going to let us stay and chit chat, but I'm going to so sort of do a official farewell and thank you. Please come back for next week's office hour and other friends events, and please consider joining with friends. We would love you to do so. I'm going to stop the recording, but we can continue to chat among ourselves.